Dear friends, you have really shown a robust war spirit today to have made it here with the kind of weather emergency that we have. If we need, we have all preparations to rescue you out of the church later today should you need our help. So please feel secure, focus on the talk and the music that will follow. Can I just say that there will not be any questions after Professor McMillan's talk um, this, this evening. Uh, we have a choir performance, but you may uh, ask uh, questions uh, as part of tomorrow's conference. Um, as um, I'm Homi Baba, director of the Mahindra Humanity Center, and I'm delighted to welcome you to Professor Margaret McMillan's keynote, The Paradoxes of Peace, the opening event of our conference to mark the centennial of the Great War. The general complaint against the weather might actually serve us well. The icy pavements banked by walls of snow black out the sky and create a certain trench-like feel. And the frigid air has left many Cantabrigians with frozen smiles, stiff upper lips, and a spirit of fierce resistance. Thank you. Let's follow the example of the weather, and in the next couple of days, stir up a storm of ideas and discussions. I hope it will become clear over the next days why the Mahindra Humanities Center, rather than any department or center of regional studies, is the ideal venue for rethinking and reliving the Great War. The war has baffled the, casual lo the causal logic of historians, tested the mettle of the finest poets, artists, and writers, and challenged the institutional imaginations of politicians and political theorists. Although the war was fought largely on the flatlands of Northern Europe, it was also empire's war with over two million soldiers from India, Africa, Canada, and Australia. The international and interdisciplinary dimensions of our program reflect the fact that the Humanities Center, at its best, is the crossroads of the campus. We consider it our responsibility, not simply our duty, to use a distinction frequently made by Margaret Macmillan, to further the conversation across the campus by provoking doubt and deliberation, by obliging ourselves to arrive at the crossroads and depart in a direction that remains untested, to follow paths untried and untrodden. We have organized this conference in conjunction with our three-year Mellon Foundation seminar on violence and nonviolence, a university-wide initiative that in this first year is exploring many dimensions of war across time, space, modes and methods of inquiry, interpretation, and representation. Margaret Macmillan's work stands preeminently at the crossroads of discussions on the Great War, and this doesn't surprise me at all. I first spotted her talent for making new moves and subtly shimmying around overcrowded spaces while observing her skill on the dance floor at St. Anthony's College, Oxford, in the 1980s, the graduate college to which she has now returned as warden. Remember, Margaret? Fine historians, <clears throat> fine historians rarely dance to their own music. The best of them take upon themselves the responsibility to pick up the deep, 
underlying rhythms of the past in order to change the very tempo of our own times. And this has certainly been the effect of Margaret's remarkable revisionary reflections on World War I. Moving the discourse away from diplomatic history and the manipulations of great men, Margaret does not neglect the importance of choice, agency, and character in the making of the historical event. She retains the best of a more traditional approach while viewing the war also as a war of ideas and institutions. Her vivid sense of detail tracks the day-by-day -day tribulations and triumphs of warfare, the sorrow and the salvation, while linking the quotidian to the encompassing edicts of social Darwinism and its belief in the survival of the fittest. Don't ask me who started the war or I'll burst into tears. Margaret once stymied a journalist who wanted yet another reductive version of the causes of the war. In refusing to play the blame game, Margaret emphasizes the crucial importance of choice and responsibility as they play their part in the making of the historical event itself, as well as in shaping the historian's narrative account of the event. She writes, if we want to point fingers from the 21st century, we can accuse those who took Europe into war of two things. First, a failure of imagination in not seeing how destructive such a conflict would be, and second, their lack of courage to stand up to those who said there was no choice left but to go to war. There are, Margaret concludes, always choices. In Margaret's hands, the emotions of patriotism, honor, xenophobia, chauvinism, often seen as uncontrollable, inflammatory national passions that fuel both courage and pillage become fundamental questions of political and ethical choice. There is nothing inevitable about them is a lesson I learned from reading Margaret's work. The lessons for our own times are much too obvious to be spelled out. What needs to be acknowledged is our profound appreciation of Margaret's insistence that what is at stake in the writing of history is not, in most cases, pointing fingers at the past, but taking on the ethical responsibility of judicious interpretation as an obligation to the present and the future. The right to responsible interpretation is at the very heart of the humanities. And it is in this spirit that I warmly welcome Margaret Macmillan to take the floor and inaugurate our conference. Thank you for accepting our invitation. Well, thank you for that very warm introduction, and thanks to the Mahindra Center for inviting me. It's a great pleasure to be here, and I'm trying to resist the temptation to make jokes about the snow. Um, as a Canadian, of course, um, we deal with snow a lot, uh, but I will leave it there. I think the thing that I start with when I'm thinking about Europe in 1914 was that extraordinary period in European history, extraordinary for Europe, perhaps not for other parts of the world, where Europe actually had almost a century of peace. Now, we can qualify that, and we should qualify it. There were wars. There were certainly wars around the world. There were colonial wars. But for most Europeans, those were very far away, and they didn't count in ways that disrupted European lives. There were short wars in Europe, 
but they were mostly, with the exception of the Crimean War, between two protagonists, and they were mostly short. The war between Germany and, or the, the German Confederation and Austria-Hungary in the 1860s was over in seven weeks. And those wars ended with a clear victory, a decisive victory, and then things went on. And so by 1914, I think you had a Europe in which many people had got used to peace, had come to think that peace was the normal course of events, had come to assume that war was something that was no longer very likely to happen in Europe, certainly not a general war of the sort that they had seen in the Napoleonic Wars and in earlier conflicts. And if war had not become impossible, at least it was very improbable for a lot of Europeans. But at the same time, and this is, I think, the paradox I want to try and talk about this evening, there were also those who said war is still something we do. War is something that is part of human nature. International relations, in the end, are anarchic. They are an attempt by one nation to defend itself against others or to further its interests. There are no rules in the international order. And in the end, you may have to result, resort to war. And you also had those who said peace is not good for us. Peace has lasted too long, we're getting soft, there's something wrong with European society if we're not prepared to fight for our homelands, for our families, for our societies, or for whatever we believe in. And so that long period of peace left this sort of tension, I think. Europe I, I see very much as a continent in play. It was not foreordained that Europe would go down the road that it went down in 1914. It had escaped a conflict on previous occasions, a general conflict. It had escaped a conflict in 1908. It had escaped a conflict in 1911. It had escaped earlier con possible major conflicts. Um, the two Balkan Wars of 1912 and 1913 both threatened to set off a general European conflict, but they had not. And so Europeans can be forgiven for thinking in 1914 when the crisis began that this was just another of those crises that would sooner or later be settled. But again, there were those who said, maybe this time we really should go to war. Maybe this time we should not back down. And so I think Europe was very much a continent in play with conflicting impulses, conflicting views about war, conflicting views about itself. Let me just give you a couple of um, quotations. Stefan Zweig, the great Austrian writer, wrote in the last book he wrote in his memoir, talking about his childhood before the First, first World War, which he called the golden age of security. He said, people no more believed in the possibility of barbaric relapses, such as wars between the nations of Europe, than they believed in ghosts and witches. Our fathers were doggedly convinced of the infallib infallibly binding power of tolerance and conciliation. He wrote that in 1941, an exile in Brazil from Hitler's Nazis, and shortly afterwards he and his wife committed suicide. In that same period before 1914, however, you had people like the futurist Italian artist Marinetti talking about war as the hygiene of civilization, war as something that was good for civilization. Now, of course, every society and, and every world, and our, our own included, has these contradictory impulses, these contradictory ways of looking at great issues such as war and peace. But perhaps the tensions in Europe were getting more acute by the turn of the last century. Perhaps if you look at Europe, and of course it's always easier looking back, you can see a number of tensions in European society which helped to make it perhaps a less stable society than, we, than people at the time thought. Let me just take five of these because there are many others and I'm sure there are people here who will be able to think of, of many more. But let me tonight just look at five different sorts of tensions one is the tension between modernity and tradition within society. And this was a time of tremendous change for Europe, but there was also tremendous resistance to change and great parts of Europe which really had not yet begun to experience change. There was also a tension between globalization and particularism. The period before 1914 was the great age of globalization. And we tend to think that our great age of globalization since about um, the 1990s um, is the first time the world was truly globalized. And of course, that's not the case. The period before 1914 was a time of tremendous globalization. But that also created a resistance and, and people um, resisting globalization tended to cling to, to smaller and different identities. There was also a tension in European society between a great faith in science 
that science could unlock all the mysteries of nature, all the mysteries of, of human nature as well. And a temptation or, or resistance to science, a temptation towards irrationality, um, towards moving away from science, to no longer trusting science. There was also the, fit, the fourth of the, the five things I want to look at is the tension in European society between confidence and fear. I mean, we look back at those pictures of Edwardian society and we see these sleek and well-dressed people who look enormously self-confident. And we think we see a society in which people really felt they were living in a golden age of security. But there were also fears in that society. Fears about the future, fears about the past, fears about the way society was going, fears of each other, fears of neighbors. And the final thing I want to look at, which leads directly to the catastrophe of 1914, 1918, is that tension or the, the paradoxical um, tension in Europe between peace and progress on the one hand and militarism and the planning for war and the assumption that war was something that was going to happen. So before I start, what I'd like to do is just remind us all of what tremendous progress Europe had made in the century before 1914. Many Europeans themselves had experienced a tremendous change in the way in which they lived. They had seen it in their own lifetimes or in the lifetimes of their parents. Europeans between 1815 and 1914 had really begun to live in very different ways. Industrialization, science and technology, the spread of communications, urbanization meant that by 1914 far more Europeans, particularly in the western part of Europe, were living in cities and towns than would have been living in cities and towns in 1815. Europeans were eating better, living longer, they had better medical care, they had greater access to consumer goods. And so the progress which Europeans had seen, they could measure in their own lifetimes. Now this progress, of course, was not equally shared all over Europe, and there were great pockets in Europe where people still lived in ways that they might have lived in the 18th or the 17th or the 16th centuries. But even Russia, which I think we wrongly tend to think as somehow sunk somewhere in the 16th century, even Russia was changing. And in the decade before 1914, Russia was changing very fast indeed. Russia was expanding industrially. By 1914, it was the fifth biggest industrial power in Europe. It was the biggest agricultural exporter in Europe. Half the children in Russian cities were now in schools. And it was the goal of the government to have every Russian child have at least a primary education by 1922. Of course, that wasn't going to happen because other things were going to intervene. And the Russians themselves were conscious of the ways in which Russian society was, was changing and developing. Just to give you one more example, the biggest single newspaper in Moscow in 1914 had a circulation of 800,000, which gives, I think, an indication of the ways in which Russia very rapidly was beginning to change. And so I think Europeans were very conscious of the enormous advances that European civilization, as they called it, had made between 1815 and 1914. Of course, the conclusion they often drew from that was that Europeans were not just uh, a fortunate people, that Europeans were in some ways a better people, that European civilization was better, not just in terms of material advantages, but better in all ways. European religion, they assumed, was better. European ways of thinking, they assumed, were better. European ways of organizing themselves, they assumed, were better. But they had, I think, reason for such complacency. And Europe was also, of course, the most powerful part of the world. And again, Europeans were very conscious of this. Europe, either directly or indirectly, controlled most of the, the Earth's surface, directly through its great empires, indirectly through its tremendous financial and economic power. Europe was the center of world industrial production. Europe was the center of world trade. Europe was where you went if you wanted to borrow money to develop your own infrastructure or to build factories around the world. Europe was collectively uh, was the world's dominant science, scientific and technological power. European armies, European navies were the most powerful in the world. And so Europeans can be excused for really believing that what they saw was some, in some ways a reflection of inherent European values, um, inherent, uh, inherent European um, superiority. They also assumed that it was going to go on. And so this is the world in which these tensions which I've talked about now began to play out. And one of the great tensions was, in fact, the result of the very progress that Europe had made. And this is the tension between modernity or modernization and tradition. 
And it was not an easy transition for many Europeans. People felt disru disrupted, disturbed by the ways in which society were changing. It was not, it's often very difficult when rapid change takes place. I think we're feeling the same ourselves with, with the tremendous technological transformation that we're going through, the tremendous electronic transformation of our society. And I think this is something which we are feeling uneasy about. Are we going to be human in the same way 20 years from now? And what, what is going to happen to us? And I think there was some feeling of that in Europe. The change, it was, it was felt, was something that perhaps wasn't always desirable. The old ways were perhaps disappearing. And of course, there were classes that were particularly affected by the rapid modernization, by the appearance of new uh, commercial and industrial elites by the growth of a, of a solid bourgeois society. And so there was resistance among the elites who had been accustomed for many years to running things to suit themselves. And so although you got across Europe the spread of constitutional government, the enlargement of the franchise in Germany, you had universal manhood suffrage um, in the elections for the Reichstag. And in a number of countries, increasingly, the likelihood and the possibility of votes for women was being discussed. Um, not always a happy discussion, as we know from the suffragettes in Britain. But there were, there were the buildings of institutions, the <clears throat> widening of public participation, um, the spread of political parties, um, the growth of mass movements, the growth of lobby groups. But at the same time, there was resistance to this. And the old elites, often landed, aristocratic or gentry, held firmly to their power and often resisted the pressures that were coming from the new middle class parties and increasingly from the new socialist parties. And in a number of institutions, in a number of, <coughs> excuse me, European countries, the sons, for it was the sons of the old landed elites continue to dominate such things as the foreign office, excuse me, foreign offices, the upper levels of the military, the upper levels of the church, the upper levels of the bureaucracy. In certain countries, you couldn't get into the highest ranks of government service unless you had the right background. Um, Berthold, who was the last foreign minister of Austria-Hungary before the war, was one of the few suitable candidates for the post because he had the right sort of family. Um, there weren't that many candidates. Um, luckily, he, he wasn't that bad, but it did limit <clears throat> the sort of people who could be chosen. Increasingly, the military and even the foreign services began to have to open up to the educated sons of the middle classes. But this did not necessarily bring about a change in attitudes. Um, what you often saw in Europe was the colonization of ambitious people from the middle class by aristocratic values. And so you would get people like Ludendorff, who of course later became famous or infamous as a general in the First World War, a German general in the First World War, who came from a middle class background, but who as he became an officer, as he rose in the ranks, became increasingly aristocratic in, in his outlook. You also got the same sort of thing in the English um, public schools, which is what the English called their private schools, where you got the sons of the industrial classes and the commercial classes being made into gentlemen and not wanting to go into their father's businesses, wanting, in fact, to live in ways which they felt were, were somehow more gentlemanly. What is also, I think, interesting in this period and I think reflects the persistence of traditional attitudes is, in fact, the increased amount of dueling not in England, uh, the English had outlawed dueling some time before, but across the continent, dueling was something that officers and those who had any claims to aristocratic or, or, or gentry background were expected to do. In some armies, in the French army, a good Republican army, which presumably had, had turned its back on all this sort of thing, an officer who refused to fight a duel could be cashiered because it was felt that he was not the right sort of quality of person who should be an officer. In the Austrian army, there was tremendous resistance to any talk of abolishing dueling because it was argued that through duels, you got the right type of person to be officer. And they showed the right sort of quality. And in fact, dueling became more systematic as the century went on. You could buy books of rules on how to duel and when you should accept a duel. And you could lose your honor, and this whole notion of honor was a very slippery one, but you could use your honor if you accepted a challenge to a duel from someone of the wrong social class who wasn't of your social class. And there's a wonderful one I read um, that came out in Vienna 
before the First World War, which gave a whole series of examples of when it was all right to challenge someone to a duel. And so, for example, if you were sitting, you'd have to, of course, be of the right social class. And if someone walked into the room holding a dog whip and sort of fondled the dog whip by looking fixedly at you, that was a deadly insult. And you should immediately challenge that person to a duel. So although the world is changing, although Europeans in many ways are becoming more modern in their attitudes, there are these pockets of resistance and in some ways a, a temptation or a tendency for the older values to, to colonize or, or to affect those who are coming into, coming into society. There were also, of course, those who felt that modernization change wasn't going fast enough. And so, particularly, of course, as you went further east in Europe where change was behind what was happening in the West, you would get increasing demands for greater democracy, liberal demands, um, also demands for re revolution. Um, it worried European society that the socialist parties were growing, that the unions were growing. And this, of course, was almost inevitable given the growth of industrialization and the growth of an urban working class. But there were concerns that the tensions within European society between those who resisted change and those who wanted change were going to one day bring European society down. There was, and in ways, in ways that I think are rather parallel to our own time, real fear of revolutionary violence and terrorism and an alarming uh, a sense of alarm that somehow within our societies are people who may look like us, sound like us, but who are dedicated to destroying us. And there were a number of very high profile terrorist attacks in the period before 1914. Um, a Tsar of Russia, Alexander II, was assassinated, the grandfather of Nicholas II, the Tsar at the outbreak of the First World War. Famous Russian states, uh, statesman Stalipin was assassinated at the theater, as was an uncle of Nicholas II. The president of France was assassinated, two prime ministers of Spain, the king of Italy, and then, of course, President McKinley in the United States, whose assassin was inspired by the assassin of the king of Italy and the Empress Elizabeth of Austria. And there were also random terrorist attacks, again, which caused the sort of alarm which we've seen in our own time, when people would, terrorists would throw bombs onto the floor of the Paris Stock Exchange, or in one infamous attack, when a terrorist walked into a cafe in Paris and shot the first man he saw, because he said, if I kill a bourgeois, it's not a crime. Um, it simply didn't matter the who, he killed, who he killed at all. And that led to concern in society that the pressures were somehow getting too great, that societies were going to explode in some way, either through terrorist activities or through their internal struggles between the conservatives on the one side and those who wanted change on the other. And of course, while this was happening, this struggle between modernity and tradition, you, you got it happening in the arts as well. Um, tremendous challenges to the established ways of doing things. Um, we can all think of examples of artists who challenged the accepted canon, who ex challenged the great masters of the past, who criticized the painters, the sculptors, the musicians of the past because they felt that they were stifling creativity. C contempt for the existing order, boredom with the existing order, these things helped to fuel a noisy and very much a minority. I mean, most Europeans didn't really like what was happening, didn't like the new in the arts. When, when surveys were done, a poll was done, this was long before public opinion polls, but occasionally journals would, would ask their readers what they thought. In 1913, uh, the Journal of Education, which was quite widely read in Britain, did a poll of its readers about what sort of poetry and writing they liked, and they tended overwhelming, overwhelmingly to prefer uh, more traditional poets. But there was still this ferment in the arts, um, which I think out of proportion to the numbers tended to, to cause tremendous public, um, a public, public debate. Of course, Nietzsche was a huge influence. Um, he had a tremendous impact on the young. I've always thought partly because it's always, at least for me, I always find it very difficult to understand what it exactly is he's talking about. But you can read almost anything into Nietzsche you want. It's exciting, it's new. He reminds me in some ways of Derrida, 
Um, you know, there are tremendous aphorisms which grasp, get people's attention. Um, everyone um, who read, I mean, if you look at those who read Nietzsche and, and claim to have been influenced by him, I mean, they range from vegetarians to fascists, um, sometimes to both. Hitler was both a vegetarian and a fascist. Um, re reactionaries, um, those who are, who are revolutionaries. But Nietzsche's, Nietzsche's repeated attacks on European civilization, his suggestion that something was going to crash, that it was going to have to come down, that it would in fact be desirable that European civilization had a catastrophe so that it could in a sense start again, was enormously important, especially for younger people. Um, even the young terrorists in Bosnia, Princep and his co-conspirators had read Nietzsche and saw, found in him some sort of uh, inspiration. And so I think you had in this struggle, which is reflected not just in politics, but in society and also in the arts, I think you see something of the tensions that there were in Europe between those who welcomed change, those who accepted change, and then those who resisted it or who, who were apprehensive about it. The second tension I want to talk about, or paradox, is this one between globalization and particularism. And we tend to think of globalization, and people did at the time, as a blessing that will knit the world more closely together, that was already knitting Europe more closely together, that would help to sweep away the barriers that divided people, that, and again, we've seen it in our own age, and the assumption that the more people trade with each other, the more they see each other, the more they travel to each other's countries, the more we will all get on, and the more we will all appreciate and understand each other. And certainly, among those who hoped for a more peaceful world, there was a faith that the globalization of the period before 1914 was going to make it possible for the nations of the world to live in harmony with each other. But again, there were reactions to globalization. Not everyone wins with globalization, and a lot of people lose, as again, I think we're realizing in our own time. And there were those in Europe, the artisans, the small shopkeepers, small farmers, and big landowners who were not benefiting either from modernization necessarily or, or from globalization. They were facing competition from mass-produced goods, often produced by cheap labor around the world. They were facing competitions, competition if they were agriculturalists, and this was as much for the great landowners as it was for the small farmers, from the enormous amounts of cheap food that were coming in from the Americas, from Australia, from New Zealand which were lowering food costs for those who lived in towns, but were also lowering the value of land. And in the period before 1914, it was, there was in the countryside a tremendous um, sale and, and uh, loss of land. Um, big, big families having to sell up. Um, you know, if, for those of you who watch Downton Abbey, um, what happens to the land, what, can they keep it up, can they keep the great house up is, is a constant theme. And that's really um, it, the theme in the cherry orchard. Um, they're having to sell up because they can no longer afford to keep the property going. So there's a tremendous uh, transfer of land and a number of families simply unable to maintain their lives in the old ways. And that sense of dispossession, that sense of competition, that sense that ways of life were being undercut, and again, it goes from the artisans and small shopkeepers up to some of the great landowners, helped to fuel right-wing and reactionary political movements it also fueled a growth of anti-Semitism because wrongly, Jews were blamed for being the sorts of people who were providing competition. Um, somehow, Jewish merchants, Jewish shopkeepers got to rep came to represent all the ills of capitalism and all the ills of globalization. And so if you look in Vienna, for example, before the First World War, um, the mayor of Vienna who was elected, Richard Luger, who was elected um, often on an anti-Semitic platform was, I think, appealing to these people who felt somehow left behind and marginalized by the changes that were happening. And I think my own view is that there's a connection here to nationalism in Europe, that people clung to identities which seemed to them to represent um, a bulwark against a world which was moving too fast, which was changing too fast, which was perhaps becoming too big. And so the nationalisms we see were fueled by other things as well were fueled by education, were fueled by literacy, were fueled by, by, by communications, but I think we're also fueled by globalization, by a sense that we want, to, we want to have an identity in what is becoming a very big world. And certainly, the national tensions in Europe 
were acute by 1914. Austria-Hungary may have survived, we will never know, might have survived if the First World War had not come along, but most people thought it probably wasn't going to because the national tensions within Austria-Hungary were now reaching a very, very dangerous pitch. I mean, there were, there were scenes in parliaments in Czechoslovakia, what, what became Czechoslovakia and Bohemia, in Vienna itself, where deputies threw desks at each other, threw inkwells at each other. Um, quite often they had to close the parliaments down because it simply became um, so difficult. And of course, we all know what the nationalisms in the Balkans were doing. Um, dreadful um, competition between different nations. Britain was dealing with nationalisms. Um, the Irish question was one that preoccupied the British so much that in the summer of 1914, um, they scarcely noticed what was going on in Sarajevo and what was happening in the Balkans. And it wasn't just Scottish na the Irish nationalism the British were dealing with, they were also dealing with Scottish nationalism, an earlier Scottish national movement, and there was even a brief revival of Welsh nationalism. And so globalization, I think, helped to fuel not just these reactionary parties, but also, I think, helped to push people into clinging or to identities which, as they said, as, as I said, were, were in some ways a bulwark. So the third thing I want to look at is, is this clash or tension between science um, and reactions to science. I, I call it irrationality, which perhaps isn't fair. But part of what had led to European confidence in progress, part of what the conclusion that Europeans had drawn from what had happened to them by 1914, was that science was a very large part of the explanation of what had happened to them. And certainly in many circles, there was a belief that science could solve all human problems. I mean, it's in this period you get the growth of statistics as a really um, subject of real, or of real study, the sense that the more you know about human societies, the more you'll be able to come up with prescriptions for what ails them or predict ways in which problems might be solved. Hopes that mysteries of what it was to be human could be solved through science. Social Darwinism was part of this faith in science. It was, in fact, a very bad sort of science. It was a misapplication of Darwinian theories, but I think Homi mentioned it earlier, enormously powerful in affecting the ways in which Europeans thought about themselves, thought about the world, thought about things such as war and peace. What social Darwinism argued was that humans was, uh, and you divided, you could divide, you could divide up human beings into a set of separate species, much as you could divide up species in the natural world. And so there could be something called an English species, a German species, a French species, um, an Italian species. How you rank these species, of course, depended very much on who you were. Um, if you were the English, of course, you put yourself at the top and everyone else slightly further down the scale. If you were the Germans, it was usually the other way around. Tied into this idea was that the human species was constantly evolving and that just as species in the natural world had natural predators, so did the separate human species. Now, this belief that the laws of nature governed these human species, nations as they were often called, could lead and did lead in some circles to an assumption that as the human species evolved, whichever ones you were looking at, they would become more peaceful, more civilized. That unfortunately was not the way most people took it. The way most people took social Darwinism was that the human species were not just evolving, but they were engaged in the struggle for survival and that only the fittest would survive. It went beyond that. A number of people argued that, in fact, it wasn't just that humans' species were condemned to struggle with each other. In fact, they ought to struggle with each other. There was a moral imperative. The species that failed to struggle did not deserve to survive. Such thinking, of course, tended to find particular resonance in military circles because it seemed to justify what they did. And so the military journals of the time are filled with sort of offhand references to the law of nature being that we must always struggle and that the nation, some nations will simply be absorbed, the weaker nations will be absorbed, they'll be, um, they'll, they'll be absorbed by the stronger nations or they will simply be eliminated by the stronger nations and that this will probably involve war. And you do get German military attaches in Paris and French military attaches in Berlin talking about how the other is a hereditary enemy very much as you get natural predators in nature. And so you'll get 
um, reports from German military attaches saying, of course, the French have always been our hereditary enemies, and you will get French military attaches in Berlin saying very much the same thing. And historians, I'm afraid, add to this. Um, we are, I think, we have a pernicious influence in this period. A great deal of the history being written in Europe and being taught in European schools before 1914 was national history. And what such national histories tended to do was to posit something called the German nation or the English nation or the French nation, which was in some essential form something which didn't change, which had existed down through time. And so you got von Treitschke, the great German historian, saying the Germans were always a superior people. They were the ones who could fight the Romans, assuming that there'd always been something unchanging in its essence called a German people. Um, this led to absolutely absurd um, things. I mean, there was, there was a wonderful, I'm, I can't remember his name at the moment, there's a German historian who talked about how the German or the Teuton people was responsible for most of the major advances in Europe, that it was the most creative, the most energetic, the most... Um, the one that had most moved European civilization ahead. His problem was, as people pointed out to him, was that the French had actually done quite a lot in their past. And people pointed out to him that the French had actually built quite a few rather nice cathedrals. And there was the palace at Versailles, and the French were also very good at building forts. There was, you know, this, this, they seemed to have quite a lot of record of, of doing things. And so he, as, as academics will do, I suppose, he, he amended his theories slightly. And he persuaded himself that those people in France who had been responsible for French progress had Teuton characteristics, that they were, in fact, Teutons who had been overlaid by the Gauls who had come in. But if you looked hard enough, you could find the original Teuton bedrock there. And he would spend most of his holidays either on bicycles or going around by train, going through France and looking at tomb effigies, looking at portraits of French notables, looking at statues of French notables, and finding to his own satisfaction they all had Teuton features, a Teuton chin, a Teuton nose, a Teuton forehead. Um, this was not just, of course, um, conf confined to German academics. You got French doing very much the same thing. There was a whole uh, theory, a school in, in Paris, which argued that uh, the Germans, particularly those who lived in the north, particularly the Prussians, had the misfortune of living in a very flat country, which affected their moral sense, that they had been shaped by living in a country in which there were no highs and no lows. And so social Darwinism, I think, my view is it, its, its effect is profound, that it had a very important effect on thinking in Europe, and it tended to lead in the direction of thinking that nations were condemned to fight with each other, that war, in fact, might be the highest form of human activity, and more dangerously still, that war could not be avoided, that war was simply an inevitable part of human society. And I was very struck, someone showed me about a year ago the diary of a young British officer in the First World War who was in the trenches, and he was saying the sorts of things we would expect people to say in the trenches. It was awful. His best friends had just been killed. Um, it was a struggle that seemed to go on and on. And then he says, but what can you do? He said, it's the law of human nature. We are condemned to struggle with each other. We have no choice. And that seems to me pure social Darwinism, that, that you know, it's, it's it, I think, an interesting example of how such thinking permeated society from the very highest levels where you get the chief of the Austrian general staff, Konrad von Hotzendorf, saying we must struggle to survive, talking in purely social Darwinist terms right down to people in the trenches who were actually doing the fighting. And so I think you got science and, and a reaction to science very much as part of the tension in Europe. I would not call social Darwinism science, but it had a very profound effect. What you also got was those who reacted very strongly against any notion that science could explain the human soul or could explain human society. And you got in the period before 1914 tremendous interest in the irrational side of human beings. This was the period in which people like Gustave Le Bon were writing about the madness of crowds, the irrationality of crowds, how people behave in ways which they don't even recognize themselves they're, they're about to do. They will be swayed by unconscious forces. More, you got those who moved further away from science altogether and became interested in the paranormal. And Conrad Doyle, of course, is, is, is one of those, the creator of Sherlock Holmes. And there's a tremendous interest and again, difficult to know how deep it went, but there seems to have been quite far down in society 
in table tapping and trying to get in touch with the occult, trying to get in touch with spirits beyond, which I think is part of a reaction to science, part of a sense that science doesn't explain everything. Also a, a fascination with mysticism and with ersatz re re religions, um, theosophy, invented by Madame Blavatsky, who claims to have been in touch with Tibetan monks somewhere in the ether. It's very useful if you can be in touch with people in the ether because you never have to explain um, what they look like or how you found them. Madame Blavatsky was, I think, and theosophy was, was again, I think, more, more influential than I'd realized. Um, it was something that, that influenced a great many artists, a great many writers, but again, permeated society. Von Moltke, the younger, the chief of the German general staff, and his wife were theosophists and very much influenced by it. And von Moltke talks in his diaries and in his letters about how history, and this is pure theosophy, is a cycle, just endlessly repeating itself. But somehow when you move through the cycle, um, you often have to accept blood and disaster, which is not quite the attitude I think you want in someone who's chief of the German general staff. Um, he was enormously pessimistic about where society was going. So that brings me to the fourth of, of, the, of the paradoxes or tensions I see, which they're all related in a way, and it's between the confidence that so many Europeans felt in themselves and in their own rightness and their own civilization and their own progress, and the fear they, they felt. I mean, you see it even at the Paris Exposition of 1900, which was meant to be a triumphal celebration of how far Europe had come. But if you look more closely at some of what was there, if you look at the, 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 the pavilions, there are pavilions which show tensions between peoples, there are pavilions dev devoted to, to the military, to, to arms, to wars, but the message, at least the general message of the Paris Exposition was meant to be celebrating European civilization. Uh, people were fascinated by electricity, which was in those days very new in cities. And one of the main pavilions was the palace of electricity, surmounted by the ferry of electricity in a chariot. Um, Baia, um, Baia, the Italian futurist artist, was so taken by the Paris Exposition, so fascinated by the electricity, he named two of his daughters, Ele 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 Electrice and Luce. Um, the third one he named um, the Italian name for propeller because he was also struck by the propellers. I don't know what happened to the poor children when they grew up, whether they changed uh, their ways. But even at the, the Paris Exposition, which was meant to be celebrating progress, as I say, there were these hints of national rivalries. There were these pavilions devoted towards war. And those who went to the Paris Expo Exposition talked about some of the exhibits. One of the very popular exhibits was a moving sidewalk and people used to stand and watch. Very few people went on it, but what people would do is stand and watch to see people fall off. And there was a lot of comment, but this was actually dangerous for you. Now, the same year, the Paris Underground opened, and again, there was a lot of talk about, is it bad for us to go underground? Are we moving too fast? And this was a real fear. Um, at the very sort of confidence in their own society, again, there was a fear that perhaps it had all just happened a bit too fast. And speed itself, seemed to be something that worried people a lot. Um, there was a lot of talk about how moving too quickly could lead to illnesses. Um, every age has its own illnesses, but the illness which was popular in this period was neurasthenia, a general jangling of the nerves where people were moving too fast, life was moving too fast, and people were suffering as a result debilitating illnesses or, or getting very edgy and very tense. Um, there were those also who worried about degeneracy was human society in fact not progressing? Was the very success of European civilization in some way making people soft? Were the wrong sorts of people living too long? Were people in cities not really unhealthy? There was a lot of talk about how people in cities don't have the same robust attitude towards life and don't have the same robust physiques as those who live in the countryside. The sturdy peasant was, was increasingly held up as the sort of person that the society should, should want to value. There's a lot of fear among the military that the quality of the young men who were coming into the armed forces was not good enough. And this mattered because by 1900, every major European power with the exception of Britain had conscript armies. And there was a lot of concern about the quality of the recruits. Fear of degeneracies was something that permeated a lot of the European discourse, a very popular book by Max Nordau, the doctor from Budapest, was actually called Degeneracy. And he and others warned that European society was 
worn out, it was moving too fast, it was searching too much for pleasure, it was preoccupied by greed, by materialism. In 1905, a young British conservative published a pamphlet on the decline and fall of the British Empire, and its chapters had titles like The Prevalence of Town Over Country Life and Its Disastrous Effect Upon the Faith and Health of the British People. William Balk, who was a German authority on tactics, who wrote a very famous and, and much used uh, manual on tactics, much used by the German army, wrote, the steadily improving standards of living tend to increase the instinct of self-preservation and to diminish the spirit of self-sacrifice. The fast manner of living at the present day undermines the nervous system. The fanaticism and religious and national enthusiasm of a bygone age are lacking. And finally, the physical powers of the human species are also partly diminishing. I think uh, not by coincidence, it's in this period that you get the first real interest in eugenics, the idea that you can breed human species, again, going back to the social Darwinist idea that they can be divided up, you can breed human species as you would breed fruit, vegetables, uh, domestic animals. The first International Eugenics Congress was held in London in 1912 in the Royal Albert Hall which is right at the heart of London, very big hall, and its patrons included Alexander Graham Bell, Winston Churchill, um, and just to give a local reference, uh, Charles W. Eliot, president of Harvard. So again, you get this, this sense, this unease in society. Yes, we're very powerful. Yes, we've had tremendous um, progress, but is it all going to last? And it's striking how often you get these fears coming out, not just fears of what's happening to us, but also fears of people in our own society, people who aren't like us. I mean, I think it's no coincidence that you get hostility to immigrants in this period. I mean, there's, there's some ways in, in which Europe of pre-1914 is rather like the Europe of today. Um, who are these people? Where are they coming from? In England, you get real fear about the Jews who are coming from East Europe, coming to the East End of London. Are they somehow going to? change our civilization. And you get similar things in Vienna um, because there's a great movement of peoples in this period and a concern that this is somehow weakening society. What you also get, of course, is, is fears um, of the upper classes or the lower classes. One of the great fears in countries such as Germany or France or indeed in Britain was that the lower classes were getting too powerful, that they would eventually try and seize power by force, or an equal fear that they would not fight for the country if war came. And there are German historians who argue that one of the reasons Germany went to war in 1914 was a flight from this fear, a flight outwards, a, a f flight away from what they feared would be internal fighting within their own society. And again, there were those who argued that war actually might be a way of solving this dilemma, that the tensions within society, the hostilities among the different classes, among the different uh, political organizations might actually be muted, might actually be um, dealt with if a war came, that people might come together to fight a war. Um, or if they didn't come together, a war would be a very good excuse to do something about them. Bethmann Hallweg, the German chancellor, who was one of the more uh, reasonable figures in the upper levels of, 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 of the German state in 1914, not reasonable in all ways, but at least had some political sense, actually had to persuade, as the war approached, he had to persuade and convince the German high command not to arrest all the socialist leaders. Um, he said to them, I think I can bring them around. And in fact, he did. The socialists voted for war credits and at least initially supported the war. And so Europe was in some ways a more fearful place than one might imagine. And so let me just come to my last of the five tensions in Europe, and that is the tension between the forces of peace and the forces for war. And of course, the danger with looking back at the outbreak of the First World War is we assume it was bound to happen. And we can find so many reasons why it was bound to happen. Look at nationalism, we look at economic rivalry, we look at national rivalries, we look at the instability in the system, we look at the arms race. Um, some people have looked at the railway timetables. And you can find all sorts of factors why the First World War might have happened. That, to my view, doesn't mean that it was inevitably going to happen. I mean, the, the danger in always looking back is you can, you, you're looking back for reasons why something happened. And so those reasons perhaps assume greater importance than reasons why it might not have happened. But what I think is important to remember in the, in the Europe before 1914 is that there were many who not just thought that peace was a natural state of affairs, but worked actively for it. There was a very large 
upper class, a very large middle class with some upper class support, peace movement in Europe before 1914, and it was more international than that. It was also supported by people in, in North America, the Antipodes, uh, Japan. Um, organizations such as international jurists, international liberal politicians, some of which are still with us, church organizations. There was also a period with the growth of international NGOs such as the Red Cross. These people, these organizations put pressure on their own governments and I think in some ways had influence. I mean, one of the reasons that European governments went with a certain amount of reluctance to the international uh, conferences at The Hague, the disarmament conferences in 1899 and 19, 1907 was in fact because their own public opinion was pushing them in that direction. And so there were very organized movements of peace and, and, and in some cases a good deal of money put into it. Andrew Carnegie, the Scottish American billionaire, gave a great deal of his very large fortune to the cause of peace and paid for the building of the Peace Palace in The Hague, which you can still see. It's the most wonderful building which seems to have incorporated every known architectural style um, in history, but it, it's still there. It's the site of the International uh, Court of Arbitration. And of course, Alfred Nobel, the uh, explosives manufacturer who felt a certain guilt about what it was that he'd invented, endowed the Nobel Peace Prize and, and variously in other ways supported the cause of peace. And so there was a very um, big constituency for peace, working actively for peace, and people promoting such things as arbitration, a hope that disputes between nations could be settled by arbitration. And there was an increasing use of arbitration. Between 1794 and 1914, there were some 300 arbitrations between nations where they took their disputes to an independent third party and agreed to accept the decision. Of those 300 arbitrations, more than half are after 1890. And so people in Europe could be forgiven for thinking that there was indeed a trend here. And there really did seem to be a trend. Shortly before the war broke out in 1914, William Jennings Bryan, the US Secretary of State, managed to get some 20 arbitration treaties signed between the United States and other countries under which both parties agreed that they would take disputes to arbitration. And so I think we have to remember this. And of course, what we also have to remember was the force of the Second International, the huge socialist movement, which represented a growing number of people as the working classes were growing, as the socialist parties were growing, which met in international congresses every two to three years, and which talked, where its delegates talked about what they would do if a general European war came. And what they all said is they would do their best to stop it. Many said they would not fight in it. This would not be their war, this would be a war for the capitalists. And there was talk of, in fact, a very potent weapon which the Second International had in its hands, and that was the general strike. If the workers of the world, particularly in Europe, had gone on strike in 1914 or whenever a general war was threatened, that would have meant that the armies in Europe would not have filled up because conscript armies depended on the working classes as much as they depended on any other class. The French military was so concerned about the prospect of French reserves not coming back when called that they assumed that some 20% of the reserves would not come back. In fact, when the war came, it was less than 0.5% because in the end, what it turned out was nationalism trumped international solidarity. But that was not what was clear before 1914. And as I say, the weapons the Second International had, they could have refused to fight, their members could have refused to fight. If they'd gone on strike, the railways wouldn't have run. The ports would have come to a standstill, the mines wouldn't have worked so that coal, which was the essential fuel of the time, would not have been dug. The factories would not have been able to provide the equipment that was needed for the war effort. And so there was, I think, a willingness in many parts of Europe and in many classes in Europe to talk about ways of outlawing war and a hope that possibly it would be able to happen. On the other hand, of course, and, and that's again, we look back, we can see the sorts of forces that were pushing towards war intellectual forces, social Darwinism, I think very importantly, the idea that war was a natural part of human society helped to prepare Europeans psychologically for 1914. We can look at the nationalism. Von Moltke the Elder, who was a very much more considerable man in my view than his hapless nephew, who led um, the German high command into the, into the First World War. Von Moltke the Elder was the man who had successfully manage the German uh, high command or the German general staff in the German wars of unification. In one of his last public statements, 
1890 in the Reichstag, he said, the age of cabinet wars has ended, and by that he meant wars for limited purposes, um, controlled by governments, and he said the age of people's war is beginning, and he said it will be dreadful, and he said it will last, such wars will last for a very long time, woe be to him who sets off such a war. But that was what was happening. Nationalism was, was involving the public more in the fate of their nation, and in some cases was pushing those nations towards war. It was not something that statesmen necessarily liked. Lord Salisbury, the great conservative British Prime Minister, said that it's like having a gigantic lunatic asylum at my back, constantly pushing me to take actions that I don't want to take. Um, but there was, I think, a very dangerous type of nationalism which pushed governments to take stands, to be tough, uh, not to back down. There were also, of course, all the rivalries um, for land, for prestige. Um, honor was something that was talked about a lot. And I think it's a very dangerous word. We don't use it as much now. We talk about credibility or prestige, but it means much the same thing, the sense that a great power has to be seen to behave like a great power. In St. Petersburg in 1914, what they were saying is Russia can't back down this time because it won't be a great nation anymore if it does, that Russian honor will be shattered. And these, I think, are very dangerous things. Militarism was a dangerous force. Um, the idea both that military values are good for society, but also the idea that the military is somehow beyond reproach and beyond question. And that was one of the things that led to the final catastrophe in 1914, because the civilians in certain countries, Germany, Russia, Austria, Hungary, failed to question their military and the military plans. The arms races. People were arming, and Mark, marked increase before 1914. Of course, they felt it was defensive. They said they were only doing it to defend themselves. What looks defensive on one side of the border looks offensive on the other side. And so you got to a situation by 1914 where I don't think Europe was fated to go down this road, but there were these tensions and there were those, I think, increasing numbers who thought that war was no longer improbable, but in fact, probably something that was going to happen and perhaps even desirable. And there is a factor which it's very hard for us to accept, I think, in, in peaceful democratic societies. Uh, but for a number of people, war was glamorous. And I think we notice this even in our own societies. Um, if you go into bookstores, you will see how many books there are on war, how many war games there are, how many movies on war. And in a funny way, the longer I think the peace had lasted in Europe, the more war did become something that younger people found exciting. Um, Marinetti, again, kept on going on about the filthy, rotten peace in which we live. Rupert Brooke longed for some kind of upheaval, something to change. And you got young Germans saying, we're so tired of hearing from our fathers and our uncles about how they fought in the German wars of unification. We would like to test ourselves as well. Even Richard Strauss, by no means a military character, said on one occasion that he'd like to take part in a war. Um, he thought he perhaps could be an ambulance driver. And his wife, um, who was rather a forceful character, said, don't be ridiculous, Richard. She said, you faint every time you see blood. And he looked a bit shamefaced and said, yes, but I'd like to test myself. And so I think there was also that dangerous feeling in Europe. Well, as you know, the final crisis came. Europe went appallingly quickly, five weeks from the assassination in Sarajevo to the outbreak of a general war on the 4th of August. And we all know what the results of that war were. It really was a moment when the world changed and what existed before was never going to be the same as what existed afterwards. The scale of the destruction, the scale of the loss, the spread of war beyond the combatants on the battlefield into societies, the beginnings of total war, where civilians are as much part of the war and as much targets of war as the soldiers, which of course we saw to a much greater extent in the Second World War. And perhaps the awful thing, and when the guns fell silent more or less in 1918, that the war hadn't really settled anything. It had destroyed a lot, but what it had left behind was more tension, more unsettled business, more violence. It's been argued, and I think there is something in it, that much of the violent rhetoric and the street fighting and the violent politics of the post-1918 period was in fact a direct result of the First World War. And so we look at that Europe. What I always want to say, and I felt this as I was writing my book, when I got to the last bit, please don't do it. You don't have to. You actually do have a choice. But they didn't in the end, or they took the wrong one. Thank you.
profiles of all our speakers and their works to be found in the conference program, which will be available to you tomorrow. To conclude this afternoon's portion of the conference, we are honored to have with us the Harvard University Choir under the direction of Edward Jones to sing one of the songs of farewell composed by Charles Hubert Hastings Perry between 1916 and 1918 in memory of those who died in the Great War. We look forward to seeing you tomorrow at 9.30 in the morning at the Radcliffe Gym. Now, I hope like magic that the choir will appear from somewhere. Bye.